So I've been asked at press conferences, when you die, who's going to take your place? You! Welcome to Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham. It's a series of messages from Billy Graham offering insight to equip and encourage you to share your faith with others. Sharing your faith, says Will Graham, is something God calls all followers of Jesus Christ to do. Now, we may not be called an evangelist like my grandfather and go around the world and preach, but we're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ, even if it's at home, even if it's on the road. This is Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham. To get the most out of these programs, you might want to consider taking notes and sharing what you've learned with others. The message you're about to hear on this episode is one Billy Graham shared during Urbana 76. Urbana Student Missions Conferences are held about every three years, and Billy Graham spoke at quite a few of them. This particular message was from the 1976 conference, which was held on the Urbana campus of the University of Illinois. Let's listen now to Mr. Graham's message, Responding to the Glory of God, here on the Billy Graham Channel. Tonight, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the first chapter of John's Gospel, And I want to read only two verses, and I'm speaking of the 14th and the 15th verses of the first chapter, and I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father. John bore witness to him and cried, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, for he was before me. There are three things that this passage tells us tonight that I would like to share with you if I might. First, this passage tells us that God has declared his glory. Secondly, they would remind us that we have beheld his glory. And thirdly, they would challenge us to declare his glory to the nations. First, God has declared his glory, and the Word was made flesh. The people of Israel in the wilderness had a tabernacle or a tent where they worshiped God, and there the glory of God was actually seen, located in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. There was a glorious light. It was called the Shekinah, and it was the symbol of God's presence with his people. It reminded them that God was not simply the invention of their imaginations, but was the sovereign, glorious, and holy God of the universe, and that they were his people. In the New Testament, the glory of God was no longer seen in the Shekinah light. The glory of God is summed up in the incarnation, the coming of the Son of God to earth. And John says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And it's interesting that the phrase literally means the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. In a far greater sense than the tabernacle of the Old Testament, God has taken up residence with man by being born in a stable among animals. But who is this Jesus? who was born in the most humble circumstances imaginable. Who is this Christ that demands that I give him everything I've got? Who is this Christ that demands that I surrender my will totally and completely to him? Who is this Christ that demands that I come to him and ask him to help me choose a life's mate? Who is this Christ that asks me to change my lifestyle? Who is this Christ that makes such tremendous demands? Is he just a revolutionary hero? Was he an evil man, a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber? Did he have a devil as they said he did? 
I cannot help but ask the question that Saul asked on the road to Damascus 2,000 years ago. Who art thou, Lord? Who are you? Who is this Christ? Who is this Jesus? Plays, books, operas, movies are being made about Jesus. Well, first we know that he was a man. The Word became flesh. The Logos became flesh. And we know that he was hungry and thirsty and tired. We know that he had friends and we know that he felt lonely at times and we know that he wept at the tomb of a loved one. The scripture says in every respect he was tempted like we are. Yes, he was tempted. Tempted like you. Do you mean to tell me that he was te Yes, he was just like you. But he was more than a man. He claimed to be the unique son of God. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am that I am. And when he said that, he set himself apart from every other man that ever lived. No other one ever said that. Paul, writing to the Colossians, declared, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things were created. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. There is a stickum that holds this podium together. Throughout the whole world, what is it? Who is it? What chemical is it? The Lord Jesus Christ, if he ever took his hand off of it, it would explode. Incredible, impossible. But that is what the scripture teaches. That he is the image of that invisible God that created those one billion galaxies and in every galaxy a billion stars and planets and beyond that infinity. And we have no instruments that can go there. And back of it all is this Jesus Christ. He was fully man, but he was fully God. And that's the mystery and the wonder of the incarnation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He made the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak and he fed the hungry and he had compassion upon us and he has the hairs of our head numbered and he sees the sparrow fall. That's the Jesus that's making the demands upon us tonight. There was only one man that ever lived a sinless life and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the cross, he, the righteous, holy Son of God, took upon himself your sins and my sins. John 17, 1. Turn to it if you have your Bibles. John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus. and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. He was talking about Calvary, talking about the cross. This was not the hour of his ascension, but of his descension into hell. The only mention of the atonement in the Apostles' Creed is when we say he descended into hell. That's the reason we leave it in. He took your hell, your judgment, your sin. He was made to be sin for us. We do not usually think of that as glorification. He said... Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. He looked upon the crucifixion 
and the descent into hell and the bearing of your sins as glorification, the glory of God and the greatest glory of God this universe has ever seen is our Lord Jesus Christ on that cross dying for you and for me and in some incredible way God took your sins and your guilt and mine and laid them on Jesus Christ and he became the cosmic scapegoat and bore our sins and carried our sins and now God can say to you your sins are forgiven and God remains just and at the same time the justifier and you become justified in the sight of God as though you had never committed a single sin think of going to bed tonight and knowing that every sin is totally completely forever forgiven just as though you'd never committed it it goes beyond forgiveness the word was made flesh man's greatest problem tonight is sin I heard on the radio today when I was going out here to a home to speak to a nursing home and as we were going along the radio was on in the car And they made an un frightening announcement. They said that the Soviet Union and the United States are both desperately, frantically working on a laser death ray. And whoever gets there first will have the power to control the world. We don't know, but we do know that the world is rushing at this moment towards some sort of a climax. I personally think that climax is the glorious coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. This time is King of Kings and Lord of Lords to take charge of this planet. But till then, There is no possible solution to all of our problems apart from him. It's a very interesting thing to me in studying the life of our Lord. He did not, he only had three years of public ministry and he did not heal everybody. He had the power to, but he didn't do it. He didn't feed everybody. He had the power to take those stones and turn them into bread and feed the world, but he didn't do it. And when he came to the end of his life, do you know what he said? He said, Father, I have finished the work that thou hast given me to do. He didn't go racing around madly. I heard Dr. Barnhouse say from this platform once at Urbana, he said, if I only had three years to serve God, I'd spend two of them in preparation and one out preaching. I think we must recognize there is a sovereign God. Nothing takes him by surprise. He's in control. He has not lost control. Satan is not going to win. The forces of evil were defeated at the cross. They took him down from the cross, buried him. They said, we're finished with him. But God spoke. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And tonight we're not talking about a dead Christ. We're talking about a living Christ that sits tonight at the right hand of God the Father interceding for you and me. Our great high priest who's coming back again to be crowned King of Kings.
It sends cold chills up and down me just to think about it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and dwelt. And this is our message to a dark and lost world. People without the good news of the gospel, I don't know what they do. In their troubles, in their despair, the philosophers of our time, you see it in the art world, nothingness, dotism, nihilism, the emptiness of it all, and the hope and the joy and the thrill and the glory that we found in Christ. I feel like that man they used to tell about, and it was a true story, that he was on his way to the gallows, and the chaplain in England was trying to talk to him about Christ, and suddenly this man on the way to the gallows turned to the preacher, and he said, If I believe what you're saying, I'd crawl across England on broken glass to tell every person in England about this Jesus. And that's exactly what God may be calling some of us to do. This is the message we proclaim to a broken, despairing world, a bleeding world. In Africa, we were reminded time after time by speakers that this is a bleeding continent. America is a bleeding country. Not in the same way of Africa, in a different way, from psychological pressures, the pressures of modern life that are driving 11 million of us to become alcoholics, other millions to become drug addicts, driving us into escapisms of every kind just to get away from it all. Secondly, John not only tells us that God has declared his glory, he also reminds us that we have beheld his glory. We've seen it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory. The glory of the only son from the father. Now many people of Jesus' day did not see the true glory. The masses saw him as a provider of bread and a possible revolutionary. But when he refused to conform to their selfish expectations and began to talk about a cross and self-denial, they said, uh-uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to set up a kingdom, Lord, right here on earth, and you were going to be the king and we were going to be the cabinet. I didn't know that uh, really that you were talking about denying self and going to a cross because the cross was the symbol of execution. That was the same as taking your electric chair, taking your gallows with you. Well, Lord, we didn't count on that. Count us out. That eliminated about 90% of his crowd. The religious leaders saw him as a potential threat to their position and demanded his death. And Judas did not see the glory of God in Christ. Pilate didn't see it. The unrepentant thief on the cross didn't see it. And many people today do not see it. We live in an age of massive, all-pervasive, crushing secularism in America. We see the television set. The one-eyed monster. And we bow to it and we have our devotions in front of it. We have our family time in front of it becomes our God and we're guilty of a new idolatry and a new medium that has come right into our homes bringing education yes but bringing other things as well God has never promised that we would be anything other than a minority swimming against the stream of this world's materialistic thinking Jesus warned, and above a narrow gate. He said the gate's narrow. If you want to follow Christ, you've got to go through a narrow gate. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life. And those who find it are few. Those who really mean business all out are few. And I'm not going to kid you tonight.
I'm going to tell you it's tough to be a Christian. I haven't found it easy all the time. You know, we got into this idea of easy discipleship and easy following Christ in some sort of a thing in the past few years. And it was almost like taking a drug and getting on a high and Jesus would keep you on this great big high all the time. My life hasn't been that way. I have a lot of lows in my life. And we heard about some of them today and we heard about some of them last night. And you read the Psalms. I read five Psalms every day. And that takes me through the book of Psalms every month. And the psalmist was up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So discouraged that at times he was like a pelican in the desert. Or like an owl in the wilderness. That's what he said. Have you ever felt that way? And you look at other people and they're full of joy and happiness and they seem to be on top all the time. I heard Dr. Norman Vincent Peale one time, he said, Boy, he said, when I wake up in the morning, I jump out of bed and I say, Praise the Lord another day. I don't do that one. <laughs> Sometimes I do, especially at Urbana. But sometimes I grumble my way out of bed. You're listening to Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham. We'll return to Billy Graham's message, Responding to the Glory of God, in just a moment. But first, we want to let you know that you can find additional resources to help you be more confident in sharing your faith at our website, thebillygrahamchannel.com. Click on Grow in Your Christian Faith. Again, that's thebillygrahamchannel.com. Equipping other people to share their faith. That, says Will Graham, is something his grandfather was very serious about. So this is the very heart and the DNA of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This comes from its founder, Billy Graham. He wanted this to take place, and he encouraged us. And he would do this in different ways, where he would bring men and women from all around the globe to come and to be trained. And in fact, it was one of those gatherings at which Billy Graham preached the message you're listening to on this episode of Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham. Let's return now to Responding to the Glory of God from Urbana 76, a student missions conference held at the Urbana campus of the University of Illinois in 1976. Because God has declared His glory and because we have beheld His glory, we must declare his glory to the nations of the world as John the Baptist bore witness of him. We must respond. We must declare his glory to the nations. Look at John the Baptist in verse 15. John bore witness to him. John knew the glory of God and he couldn't keep silent. Many people mocked him, but he did all he could to point others to the coming Christ. How do we respond to the glory of Christ? Three words. I want you to remember them. First, conviction. Second, commitment. Third, conduct. That's how we respond. First, conviction. There is a conviction of the truth about God that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be, the Son of the living God. Do you believe that? Secondly, the Christian will have committed himself to Christ as Lord and Savior, totally without reserve, holding nothing back. And that's why the scripture places so much emphasis on the heart and not just the outward action. This involves the total man, the emotion, the intellect, the will, all of it. Are you willing to be his man and his woman regardless of what he might want to do with you in the future? How are you going to answer that tonight? Thirdly, there must be conduct. We must live what we believe. Jesus said that we would be known by our fruits, and the greatest fruit is love. Do we really love this world for whom Christ died? Are we acting upon that love by love? 
serve one another. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. We have to become servants. We're to serve one another in love. If these things are a part of your life and if you're seriously considering God's will for your life, you cannot help but take with complete seriousness his call to serve. His commission is inescapable. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We cannot escape these great commission texts. That's what drove that group 40 years ago. They read those great commission texts. They took them seriously and literally and went out. And tonight we are here because some people dreamed a dream that the world could be evangelized in this century. We may have a short time. We may have a long time. No one knows. But I have a feeling that we better work while it is day because the night cometh when no man can work. And you know, Jesus somehow tied the proclamation of the gospel to the nations with his coming again because he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then will the end come today. We have the technology to carry the gospel to the whole world and there's not an iron curtain or a bamboo curtain or any other curtain that can keep the gospel out today. But I warn you this, as you've already been reminded so graphically and dramatically, it's going to cost you. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Christ asks you to renounce your plans. One of the first things Christ did to me when I came to him was he said, you've got to give that girlfriend up. And I was in love. It was puppy love, but it was real to the puppy, let me tell you. <laughs> she wouldn't make the commitment. So I went over her, to her house to tell her. It took me four hours. And I cried all the way home. And I was doing it just for Christ's sake. And I'm sure people would laugh and smile at that little thing, but that was the first step. God was testing me. He was changing my plans to conform to his plans. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to make his goals your top priority? He asks that your ambitions and your motives be his. Are you willing to do that? Well, let me tell you, we might as well forget missions and forget the whole business until, first of all, you have surrendered totally to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the word Christian is used only three times. In Acts 11, 26, Acts 26, 28, and 1 Peter 4, 16. And in each of these occasions, there's the idea of suffering and persecution in the background. No, Christ does not promise that all is going to be easy and trouble-free for us. We've been living in a very abnormal situation in America in the last few years. By and large, the totally committed Christians throughout history have been suffering people persecuted people. And if you really commit yourself to do the will of God, whether it be missionary service or whether some other type of service in this country, what are they going to do to you? What did Christ tell his disciples? Turn to Matthew 10, you'll read it. First he said they'll deliver you up. This type of opposition is seen throughout the book of Acts. Secondly, he said they'll scourge you. Christ himself was scourged. 
Many of his followers were scourged. In modern America, there can be psychological scourging at a university campus when they see you going to a prayer group and when they see you going to a fellowship and when they see you with a Bible. Some of the kids in the dormitory will scourge you with their tongue and their smart remarks. But let me tell you, they'll watch you and they'll respect you because they're searching for what you've got and they're waiting to see if it's real in your life. And if it's real, most of the people that put up the biggest fights against Christ are people that are really wanting you to convince them by the way you live and the way you talk and act. They want to be convinced. They want to see if somebody really believes it, if somebody really lives it. That's the reason people like Moon and all these other messiahs that come over here get a big following. That's the reason a little 16-year-old guru who I think was 35 <laughs> could get a crowd around him. And then thirdly, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 23, they will persecute you. And then fourthly, he said, they'll put you to death. And all the disciples were put to death with the possible exception of one. Yes, it costs to follow Christ. But if you've glimpsed the glory of what God has done for us, there is no price too great to pay to declare his glory. In the dormitory, in the school, we need to get in those positions so that we can have an influence for Christ at the university. And stop going around with our heads hanging down as though Christ is still in the grave and we're sort of apologizing for him. We've got the message that can change the world. And we ought to not be ashamed of it. Yes, he is worthy of our sacrifice. He is worthy of our utmost for his highest. The wonder of it is that we're not alone. God has promised us full resources in the battle. What are they? Christians would retreat, deny, and fall under the attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil if they did not have resources superior to the forces of evil. The scripture says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What are these resources? First. God will give you the gift of speech. Did you ever think about that? The how and the what of our defense will come supernaturally. The scripture says it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. This happened to Peter and Stephen and Paul and it'll happen to you and it's happened to me on occasion. Secondly, there's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The early Christians were equipped by the Holy Spirit in their defense. Thirdly, there's perseverance. The endurance unto the end does not mean that our salvation is contingent upon our own endurance. Our salvation does not rest upon our works or our money. It depends upon the grace of God. The scripture says that they are by God's power guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the latter times. God is constantly working in us the will and the doing of his good pleasure. And while God holds us as far as our salvation is concerned, we are to per persevere and be faithful in the midst of suffering and persecution. How long? How long? To the end. And fourthly, this one will surprise you. There come times when we're to flee. We're to run. Did you ever think about that? There are times when we must flee for protection. Moses did it. Jacob did it. David did it. Paul did it. He was let down in a basket to get away. And many others throughout the scripture. The Lord doesn't ask us to risk our lives unnecessarily when we face evil men bent on our destruction. When Luther's flight to Wartburg was justified by the sinister threats on his life. I remember one time I was invited by the Communist Party to address them in Maracaibo. 
And, and, and I don't know how, how it happened. I think they made a mistake. But anyway, I got up and I started talking about Christ. And while I was talking about Christ, truckloads of soldiers unloaded outside. I could see them through the window. And all of a sudden, while I was speaking, bullets began to pour into the place. Now, they weren't, I noticed that they were hitting high up. I don't think they were meant to hit anybody. But I didn't, I didn't quite know that. <laughs> and the fellow that introduced me pulled his coat back, and here were two pearl handle pistols, and he pulled them out. And he said, follow me. Now, Newsweek magazine reported it, and they said that Billy Graham got under a table and was praying the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> now, I was not praying the Lord's Prayer. I was running. <laughs> and I remember one night in Soho in London, some chaplain, Anglican chaplain, one of had, had talked me into coming down there and preaching at midnight. Well, I went down there to preach at midnight and here were Klieg lights from everywhere and the television cameras from everywhere and a giant crowd from everywhere and the police from everywhere. And I knew that I shouldn't be there. But I got up on top of a car and started preaching with a bullhorn about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I saw out of the corner of my eye something beginning to happen. I saw a girl being handed by men from one man to the other being pushed toward me. And I knew what was coming. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I found out later she was paid to do it. She was on drugs and she was going to come and unzip and stand there nude with me and pictures were going to be taken. Well, I saw that, and I said, see you at Earl's Court tomorrow night, God bless you, and I jumped in the middle of the policeman. <laughs> there come times to flee, and that was one other. <laughs> and fifthly, We've already mentioned the coming of the Son of Man. This will be the ultimate hope, our ultimate escape from the sufferings of this world. And the sufferings that we endure here will be only for a moment and nothing compared to the glory that is to be ours there. As Andrew Crouch has written, it won't be long. And Bill Gaither has written, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> the Christian must always remember that he must expect the same treatment from a hostile world as his Lord received. But he also knows that Christ is with him and God's full resources are available no matter where he is. Do you know the Lordship of Christ? The question I want to ask you tonight is this. Are you ready for all this? Are you willing to pay the price? In, in 1519, Cortez outfitted some ships in Cuba to explore the coast of Mexico. And after the landing, Cortez ordered the men to have all the yardage and the sails and the metal fittings and the cannon removed from the ships. And then he ordered the ships to be burned so there could be no retreat. It was a terrible sight for those men standing on a hostile beach and a mysterious continent to their backs watching their ships burn and they would probably never see home again. Are you willing to burn those ships in your life and those bridges and say no retreat? It's all for Jesus. My life, my plans, my goals, my ambitions, my heart, my mind is His. Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll be what you want me to be. Whether it's to be a nurse or a doctor or a social worker or a preacher or a 
Bible translator or you don't know exactly what but you're willing to say I will be what you want during the Korean War the North Koreans moved into a peaceful farm village in South Korea and sometime before this a faithful missionary had brought the gospel of Christ to this village and those who were converted were soon witnessing to friends and it wasn't long that most of the people in the village had turned to Christ in their simple faith and one day the North Korean soldiers made all the people of this particular village gather at the village church and they told them that they would have to renounce their faith in Christ or face certain death and the soldiers jerked a picture of Christ off the wall threw it on the floor and ordered every person in the church to go by and spit on the picture the first one to walk by was a deacon and looking shamefacedly and afraid and frightened he spit on the picture of Jesus the second man the third the fourth the fifth one was a teenage girl she walked by and she stood there looking for a moment and tears streamed down her cheeks she picked up the picture she took her skirt and she wiped off the spittle and she said shoot me I'm ready to die for Jesus a soldier raised his gun but he couldn't fire they ordered everybody out of the church except the four men who had spit on the picture the people heard four shots the men that did the spitting were killed because they said that if you will renounce Christ so easy you would renounce our ideology just as easy too Are you ready to take your stand tonight with that teenage girl in Korea? I want to tell you something. Somebody else has said it, not me. God right now on every continent is quietly preparing his heroes. And when they're needed, they will appear and the world will wonder where they came from they are being prepared tonight and God says I searched for a man who would make up the hedge and fill the gap and I didn't find one tonight I believe throughout the world on every continent in the last few years God is preparing tens of thousands of students everywhere and I include the Soviet Union and I include China as well his heroes are being prepared and one day they may have to pay a price but the glory is theirs and tomorrow belongs to them the tomorrow belongs to us and Jesus is asking you to join him, to be his, to surrender. Responding to the glory of God, the message Billy Graham shared at the Student Missions Conference Urbana 76. This is Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God calls you to be an evangelist, someone who tells others about Jesus and his love for them. It's our hope that these programs will equip and encourage you to do that. We have other resources that can help you share your faith at thebillygramchannel.com. Click on Grow in Your Christian Faith. That's thebillygramchannel.com. 
Also, we'd love to hear your story of how the messages you hear on Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham impact you. Just record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to mystory at thebillygramchannel.com. That's mystory at thebillygramchannel.com. You can hear Evangelism 101 with Billy Graham every Sunday and Thursday at 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 10 p.m. Eastern. For decades, he was known as America's pastor. In just a few moments, you're going to hear another message from Billy Graham. This is the Billy Graham Channel on Sirius XM and the Sirius XM app.